I'd like to turn it over to uh, Noor Salome, Noor, uh, our MPA student who's done some fabulous work uh, for us uh, about the ballot measure process in California. Noor? Thanks, Dave. I'm just going to share my screen here. Give me a second. All right. So uh, my name is Noor. I'm a graduate student here at Sonoma State. Uh, thank you all for joining us virtually tonight. Um, I have been doing some independent study research on the initiative process here in California for about a year now. Uh, I wanted to preface this evening by just um, giving some context and providing some definitions to what our students are going to be talking about. So what is an initiative? You might hear the term initiative, you might hear proposition, you might hear ballot measure, and those can all be used interchangeably. But essentially what the initiative process is, is a process that gives people the power to directly propose and enact state laws or make amendments to existing state laws. Now, not every state has an initiative process. California is one of 26 and also one of the, if not the most active when it comes to uh, their initiative process. Like Dave mentioned, one of the most expensive political campaigning uh, processes in the world just behind the US presidential election. So I wanted to walk you through some of the steps of how an initiative actually gets on the ballot. So there are currently 12 state initiatives on the ballot this year. So they've all already gone through this process um, and they all essentially start with an idea. So you have this idea, you write up a proposition or what's called an initiative draft that draft is then sent to the attorney general's office who will give it an official title and summary, some fancy language. You probably pay a couple thousand dollar uh, processing fee at this point, I believe. And then the third step is signature gathering. So at this point, this is when you see people, you know, outside the grocery store on campus trying to get your signature to get their initiative to advance in this process. Once enough signatures are collected, then your initiative will either qualify or fail per the Secretary of State's office. And then of course, where we're at now, voters will be able to vote one way or the other. So these are the 12 statewide measures that we'll be voting on if you haven't already. And again, the students will cover each of these propositions um, in detail, talking about their campaign financing, who's supporting the yes vote, who's supporting the no vote, that sort of thing. So you've probably heard of some of these. Um, some of the more prominent or hot topic issues might be Prop 22 or Prop 15, uh, dealing with property tax. Prop 22 deals with the classification of app-based drivers like Uber and Lyft. So your inbox might be bombarded or your mailbox. So a lot of these topics, again, you might be familiar with or you might be learning about for the first time tonight. But as you can see, a lot of these might hit kind of close to home for some people might directly impact you one way or the other. So that's why this is really important and why we are doing this. So this graphic I just wanted to show you um, kind of highlights some of the campaign spending on both sides. Now this graphic is actually a couple of weeks old. So the numbers are a little bit not as current. However, it just does give a good overview of what's going on with some of these campaigns. So the green boxes represent the organizations and companies and individuals who are supporting the yes vote on their proposition. All the red uh, boxes represent who's supporting the opposition vote or the no vote on these propositions. So as you can see, some have a lot more green than others, some have a lot more red. And again, our students um, will go through kind of the behind the scenes of what these actually look like. But I just wanted to give you an overview visual of what is going on here. And before I pass it over to Gabriel, I just wanted to again encourage and remind everyone to register to vote. If you haven't already, you'll go to registertovote.ca.gov. Um, you can also verify your registration um, or re-register if you need to. Maybe you've moved or changed your name or whatnot. But last day to register is October 19th, so make sure you get that situated. And I'll pass it over to Gabriel. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel Guptel. I'm a graduating senior in political science and a Campus Compact Fellow um, and Research Assistant for Dr. McEwen this semester. And I'll be sharing with you some of our um, California ballot initiatives and some historical important information about them. 
Um, beginning in 1911, the initiative and referendum process um, was adopted into the California Constitution. And sorry, I'm having a little issue with my Zoom here. And citizens were given the power to propose statewide initiatives. In 1943, the cost of submitting a proposal was set at $200. And then in 1960, ballot propositions um, were first appearing on the primary election ballot, whereas previously they had only appeared on the general election ballot. In 1974, the responsibility of writing the summaries and titles for these initiatives was given to the Attorney General of California to make sure the language was impartial and truthfully representative of the uh, initiative's main purposes. In 2011, Governor Jerry Brown uh, signed a bill which reversed the 1960 change, which limited initiatives to the November general election ballot once again and took them off the primary ballot. And in 2015, Governor Jerry Brown increased the cost of submitting your um, initiative proposal from $200 to $2,000, which Noor uh, mentioned briefly. Now let's move on and talk about ballot initiative qualification. So it takes 623,000 signatures to qualify an initiative for the ballot and California has 25 million eligible voters. So it only takes two and a half percent of eligible voters in California to sign on the petition and have an initiative appear on the ballot. However, if an initiative is, avail is able to get those 2.5% of voters to sign on and qualify for the ballot, it, suddenly has a much higher chance of passing with the voters than it started with. And in fact, it has over a one in three chance of passing if it can make it through the proposal stage and qualify for the ballot. So to visualize this, I made this graph, which shows what happened to all the California ballot initiatives from 1999 to 2020. Blue shows all initiatives which never qualified for the ballot and never gathered enough signatures. The red shows all initiatives which qualified for the ballot but failed to pass with the voters. And yellow shows all initiatives which made it through the proposal stage, qualified for the ballot and were passed by the voters. And this shows us two things. First, nearly all initiatives as Dr. McEwen said are uh, never qualify for the ballot and never get enough signatures to appear on the ballot. And it also shows us that once something makes it through the proposal stage and qualifies, like I said in the previous slide, it has a much greater chance of passing than it started with. You can see this in the relationship between the yellow section and the red section here. Um, they're very similar in size to one another as compared to the blue, which shows that once it qualifies, once an initiative is qualified, it has a much greater chance of, of passing, almost a almost a 40% chance of passing. So why is this important? And why do so many initiatives get left in the proposal stage? Um, well, a fun answer to that is a lot of initiatives can be really as crazy or wild as their authors would like them to be. And an excellent example of that is um, these two initiatives, which came out of 2015 and 2016 First, the Sodomite Suppression Act, which was an initiative proposed to legally require the killing of anybody who's uh, in the LGBT plus community um, by any means. And obviously this was highly unconstitutional and our um, Attorney General Kamala Harris removed this initiative before it could ever qualify for the ballot. However, another citizen took it upon herself to create an initiative that um, was in response to the Sodomite Suppression Act called the Intolerant Jackass Act, which would label the author of any ballot measure um, calling for violence or, or a discriminatory ballot measure um, an intolerant jackass and require them to do sensitivity training as well as donate to pro-LGBT groups. So this shows us that the potential impact initiatives can have is really great. And just because something has made it to the ballot or is a proposal and looks official, um, it could have very, very severe consequences. And it's another reason why we need to pay close attention to what's in these initiatives and what's on our ballot. Um, 
So without much else, I think that's all I've got today. I want to just thank you all for joining me and um, remind you to please go vote this November. And I will pass it back to Dr. McEwen now. All right. So let's hear from our uh, let's hear from our first uh, student, uh, Jacob. Let's hear from you about Proposition 14. All right, everyone, let me get this set up real quick. All right, so my name is Jacob Arwa, as you stated. I am a senior at Summer State University in the Political Science Department. And today I'm gonna to be talking about Proposition 14, otherwise known as the Stem Cell Research Bond Initiative. The reason that this matters in particular is because it's generally a set of obligation bonds meant to go to CIRM, which is the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. It totals about $5.5 billion uh, in loans going specifically to CIRM. Over the course of 30, roughly 30 years, it will be uh, intended to be paid back in full. Uh, the total coming out to 7.8 billion uh, when including overtime interest. Uh, in general, the, uh, there is a large amount of support for this proposition and very little um, in opposition. I'll just uh, state the supporting and uh, opposition arguments for you real quick. In support, quote, this medical revolution holds the promise of restoring health and quality of life for many of California's individuals and families suffering from chronic disease and injury, end quote. That's from Robert Klein II, uh, who was the chairman for uh, the board at CIRM. And in opposition, we have, quote, it does nothing to address CIRM's built-in conflicts of interest or its lack of legislature oversight. Uh, despite it being a, uh, an agency supported fully uh, by public funds. That was uh, written by Marcy Darnowski, who was the executive director of the Center for Genetics and Society. Coming into some of the top supporters uh, th th that have donated to Proposition 14 is Robert Klein, uh, the second, who I mentioned earlier, uh, wrote the supporting argument for Prop 14. He has donated quite a, uh, a sum of money, uh, totally the highest uh, contributions out of any of these organizations, followed closely by Dagmar Dolby, Juvenile Diabetes uh, Research Foundation, Open Philanthropy Action Fund, and Anne S. Uh, Sukamoto. Uh, Anne herself is a uh, stem cell researcher. A, one of the key elements of Proposition 14 is what's called fiscal impact. Uh, the proposed payment stands as, quote, increased state costs to repay bonds estimated at about $260 million per year over roughly the next 30 years, which is currently less than 1% of the state's uh, general fund budget. Uh, uh, the chart on the right is from the official voter information guide and lists the standard uh, rate of payback and interest on this bill. So who generally uh, has been named as uh, in support for Prop 30? Uh, Governor Newsom is one, the California Democratic Party is another. Robert Klein is very, very active. Uh, the University of California Board of Regents as well, and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Uh, off to the right is a pie chart just showing somehow the, uh, the biggest expenditures, uh, campaign consultants being the highest, professional services next, and polling and survey as well as office expenses being the bottom one so far. Since there was in general, there was no actual filings or contrib contribution supports uh, in opposition to Prop 14 currently. Um, it seems fairly one-sided. 
uh, but you are more than welcome to check out any media. LA Times has several pieces um, and ballotpedia.org uh, has a lot of un, uh, unfiltered information, statistical data, uh, as well as sos.ca.gov. Um, please uh, feel free to vote on 14 according to your own personal beliefs. Thank you very much and I'll pass it on to the next person. Hi, uh, Zara, or I'm sorry, Will and Emily, I'm sorry, um, Prop 15. Be sure to expand your yes. screen so that uh, everybody can see it there. Thank you very much. And yes, okay, hello. Uh, my name is Will and my partner is Emily. We will be talking to you today about Proposition 15 or the <coughs> the Tax on Commercial and Industrial Properties for Education and Local Government Funding Initiative. Proposition 15 is an initiative constitutional amendment which seeks to change the property valuation of non-agricultural commercial and industrial properties of a single owner with a combined value of $3 million or more to be taxed at their current fair market value. This proposition also exempts small businesses from the tangible personal property tax and gives all other businesses a $500,000 exemption to that tax. The new tax revenue from the change in property valuation will go to the local school and community college tax fund. Of that money, 11% goes to community colleges and 89% goes to public and charter schools. If Proposition 15 is passed, then the changes to property valuation are estimated to generate between $6.5 and $11.5 billion as it is phased in over the next five years. If Proposition does not, 15 does not pass, then the valuation of all properties will remain the same as it currently is under Proposition 13. Now, the key element of this proposition is clearly the change of the valuation of properties. Now, this is specifically non-agricultural and commercial, non-agricultural, commercial and industrial properties, which are currently valued at their purchase price adjusted 2% yearly in an attempt to keep up with inflation. However, we have experienced over 200% inflation since the passage of Proposition 13, which is why Proposition 15 seeks to change that valuation. Wonderful. Uh, Yes. Would you like me to take it away, Will? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Emily Ann, and pronouns she, her, hers, and I will continue with Prop 15. Um, and so some historical background on Prop 15 and how things are going is 20 ballot measures have been passed since Prop 13 was passed in 1978. As Will alluded to, this was a change in the way property taxation was um, administered to property owners because of inflation and the value of homes continued to go up. So it would kind of uh, so it would stop that value of uh, that, that property tax increase for homeowners. Um, a vote yes would mean the changes in property valuation for how the tax is administered to these properties. And a no vote would be no change and things would stay the same. The picture on the bottom left is a photo um, that is um, showing what Prop 13 has done um, in an op-ed piece that was done by the LA Times. Um, and then we see the polling data of how people are feeling about Proposition 15 um, as they are voting. This polling was done in, I believe, September. So of course, there are some thoughts and feelings that have changed since then. Um, but UC Berkeley Institute has said that 17% are undecided and 49% folks are voting yes and 34% are voting no. Um, in the media, the San Diego Tribune has told their voters to vote no on Prop 15, but LA Times has told their voters to vote yes. Next slide. So who is for Prop 15? Chan Zuckerberg initiative, yes, Mark Zuckerberg and folks who have large corporations wanna keep this the same, of course, because it would change the way that their taxes are done on their properties for their large business companies. And the California Teachers Association is for it because this taxation money would be going back into the community. Um, that's why it was put on the ballot in the first place. About 11 billion more dollars would be invested in the community, but opposition is worried that this will increase the cost of living as I'll get to in a minute. Um, so another 
thing is another teacher organization and a lot of coalitions for their communities um, have been donating. There's been a lot of contrib large contributions and these campaign contributions are for um, the campaign consultants, legal teams and information technology. That's what they've been spending on up to this point. Next. So opposition, like I have said, um, they think that it's going to hurt renters, farmers, and it lacks accountability and transparency. That's what their website is kind of pushing their opposition campaign narrative to say. Um, Business Roundtable has donated over $25 million. And then just in the last week, opposition has um, fundraised $10 million more. Um, so that was a big um, game changer for their campaign, which is starting to rival the contributions you see on the bottom left um, that are almost the same as the folks who are for the proposition. Um, and opposers want to vote no because they don't want any changes to their taxation at all. Next. Oh, and we're done. Um, so a couple campaign resources that we recommend to you are um, the voter guide on the Secretary of State's website, and of course the yes and no organizations if you feel strongly. Um, either way, you can always sign up to campaign or volunteer with them as well. Thank you both very much. All right, uh, Zara, you're up on Prop 16. Oh, you're, you're muted there, Zara. Thank you. Um, Professor, could you please share my slides, please? Sure. Give me just one second. <clears throat> Give me just one second and I will, uh, I'll bring it up here. <clears throat> All right, we are ready. I will, uh, there we go. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Zara Valencia and I am a senior at Sonoma State in uh, political science. So today I'm presenting Proposition 16 to you, which is an amendment to repeal Proposition 209. And I would like to first explain Proposition 209 so I can give you some background of why Proposition 16 exists today. So Proposition 209 passed in 1996, banning affirmative action in the state of California. What Proposition 209 states is that the state shall not discriminate or grant um, to any individual or group preferential treatment based on race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public employment, education, or contracting. Prop 209 was proposed because in 1996 and the years before that, there were many affirmative action programs that were giving preference to minorities in hiring and in state contracts and in college admissions. Uh, Proposition 16 uh, proposes that we bring back affirmative action. And California is actually only one of nine states that still bans affirmative action. And as I said, affirmative action would allow for public agencies, local government, and, and, and state institutions like uh, public schools and public universities to consider once again, race, gender, color, ethnicity, national origin as factors for hiring, contracting, and admissions. Next slide, please. I have this quick little video. Um, if Professor, you could play it for me, please. Sure. One second. <clears throat> I'm not sure if we're going to be able to play it. Okay, no worries. Thank you. We'll put a link up there uh, later as well, so I apologize for that. Okay, so <clears throat> next. Uh, behind Proposition 16, we have Dr. Shirley Weber, along with a lot of other people in office who support. Dr. Shirley Weber um, is the lead sponsor of Proposition 16. And Proposition 16 has had a lot of, I guess, what the media would call confusion because what Proposition 209 states does not sound negative, but it comes down to what each person believes will fix racial inequality in our present time. Uh, next slide, please. So supporters of Proposition 16 say it would promote affirmative action and that 
because we have faced a lot of racial inequality and especially white and wealthy people continue to be disproportionately awarded in employment contracts and college admissions while minorities are still at uh, major disadvantages. Supporters of Prop 16 believe that this is how we can weigh out these disadvantages. And as you can see, supporters of Prop 16 have raised over $9 million. And uh, that speaks great for the amount and the monetary amount behind supporters of Proposition 16. We have some very important officials who are for Proposition 16, like U.S. Senator uh, Diane Feinstein, U.S. Senator Kamala Harris, our, our governor of California, Gavin Newsom, and like I mentioned before, uh, assembly member, Dr. Shirley Weber. Next slide, please. No voters on uh, Proposition 16 suggest that it does not give an equal playing field for everyone. As you can see with um, the monetary contributions that they have raised, they have not raised anything close to what uh, uh, supporters of Proposition 16 have raised. And voters who oppose this say that affirmative action does not give everyone an equal playing field. And one of the uh, officials who is against Proposition 16 is the original uh, chairperson behind Proposition 209 of 1996, which is Ward Connerly. And we also have State Senator Ling Ling Chan who opposes and State Senator Melissa Mel Melendez. At the end, uh, voters of Proposition 16 will vote on what they believe is the best way to address racial discrimination and racial inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Ali, would you like to talk about Proposition 17? Yes, let me just share my screen really quick. All right, hello everyone. My name is Allison and I am a senior at Sonoma State and I'm also a political science major. And I'm gonna be talking about Proposition 17. So Prop 17 is a legislatively referred constitutional amendment that will give people on state parole the right to register and vote after, uh, they, after their prison sentence has been served. And it will also allow parolees to run for office as long as they meet the necessary requirements. Uh, California actually passed a proposition just like this one back in 1974 that removed any wording from the state constitution that banned people from voting because of, con uh, because of being convicted of high crimes. But it was different from Prop 17 because it actually only restored the voting rights for those that had completed both their prison sentence and their parole. Um, Prop 17 will amend sections two and four of Article Two of the California State Constitution. And if it is passed, there will be increased annual costs for voter registration and ballot materials and increase one time costs to update voter registration and systems, both in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Currently, there are about 50,000 Californians who are on parole that are not able to vote. So Prop 17 would allow them to do that. Um, so Prop 17 supporters currently have a total of $846,007 in contributions. The top, the top five contributors are Susan Pritzker, who is a civil rights activist, and she has contributed about a fourth of the total that they have raised. And then following her is the ACLU of Northern California, SEIU United Healthcare Workers, the California Nurses Association, and... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's all right. Thanks, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And then finally, the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Um, of these contributions, they have spent about $249,990. And the top three expenditures that they've spent that on are um, information technology costs like internet and...
Oof. I am so sorry. <laughs> Keep oh, going so through, funny. Allie. Keep going uh, through. Like internet email, polling and survey research, and campaign consultants. The top three recipients of these expenditures are Trilogy Interactive, which is a website designer, David Binder Research, which is a public opinion research organization, and Shanta Franco Clausen, who is a campaign consultant. As for opposition, there currently are no campaigns or contributions. However, a few people and groups have spoken, about, spoken out about their, about their opposition to Prop 17, and those include State Senator Jim Nielsen, the Election Integrity Project of California, and Crime Victim in California. Polling on Prop 17 is very limited, but what there is of it shows that about 63% of people are in support of Prop 17 and would vote yes, 31% are not in support and would vote no, and 6% are undecided or would skip it. As for media coverage, there also isn't much on that, but I was able to find a few. And uh, the LA Times, San Diego Tribune, and Sierra Club California have all ran endorsements for Prop 17. And OC Register, SF Chronicle, and PBS SoCal have all run opinion pieces on it. So for more information, you can go to their, um, to the supporters website, the Yes on 17, and Ballotpedia, and Cal Matters also has a lot of information on it as well. Thank you very much. Don't forget to silence your phones, folks. Just a reminder, no problem. So sorry it happens. About that. <laughs> that happens, that's fine. All right, uh, Guadalupe, how about we hear about Proposition 18? Oh, you're muted there. Yep, let me just get that up for everyone. Thank you very much. All right, perfect. So I am going to talk about Proposition 18 today. I'm Guadalupe Hernandez. I'm gonna be speaking on what this ballot measure is set to do, as well as the campaign finances behind Proposition 18. So Proposition 18 seeks to amend California's constitution to permit 17 year olds to vote in primary and special elections if they are 18 by the next election. So in a nutshell, Proposition 18 is set to promote youth voter participation and have them let them have a voice on who will be, what candidates are gonna be appearing on their ballot in November um, under the assumption that they will be 18 and registered to vote. So let's continue to see how Proposition 18 affects you and I. Oh, let me just move forward. Uh, so Proposition 18 is a constitutional amendment. Um, it increases costs for counties around the hundreds of thousands of dollars allocated to send voting materials to eligible 17 year olds for the primaries and special elections. Uh, in, in addition to that, it, there would also be a one-time state cost of $1 million to update existing voter registration systems. Um, but both of these combined would make up around two, 3% of California's budget. Um, a yes on Proposition 18 would increase the number of voters that would be voting on special elections and primaries, and a no vote for Proposition 18 would mean no one younger than 18 years old can vote in any election, um, which is how we how our elections run currently. Um, let's move forward. So contributions to campaigns, supporters, and opponents. Unfortunately, there's not much of uh, um, committees or contributions set for Proposition 18. There's only two active committees. There's the Padilla Ballot Measure Committee, as well as the Lau and um, Kevin Mullen Committee. Uh, and both have garnered together collectively $342,423. And there is no opposition or no um, opposing committees for Proposition 18. And I'll be speaking on um, how and why that would happen in the following slides. And I got this information based on the California Secretary of State website and I updated it since today. Um, so what are the expenditures for the committees? So there's only one of the active committees is actually, um, actually has expenditures. So it's actually the Padilla committee. And um, for this committee, we see that most of their um, expenditures come from information and technology costs, 93%. 
Um, $3,545 goes to professional services and campaign consultants only make up $6,500. So 6% of their um, expenditures. Um, uh, I have also put down the contributors for the Padilla committee since they are the ones that are making the expenditures for this proposition. And they're made up of the California Nurses Association PAC, which has contributed 30,000, as well as the Southwest Regional Council, the SEIU United Healthcare Workers, um, the Real Estate Political Action Committee, and John Edward York and affiliated entities. Um, but in comparison to other propositions, um, these contributions really do pale in comparison, as well as how much money this committee has garnered. Um, so let's move on to the opposition. Um, there are opponents to Proposition 18, and we see, see them right in our backyard. Um, so the Santa Rosa Press Democrat has come out to say that they oppose Proposition 18, the Mercury News, East Bay Times, as well as the California Republican Party. However, there is no formal opposition for Proposition 18 based on the information that the California Secretary of State website puts out. Um, however, these the media coverage that Proposition 18 gets, the majority of it is um, why you should vote no. Um, the biggest argument with Proposition 18 is um, in special elections and in um, the primaries, we vote on physical um, policies and uh, a lot of uh, news sites uh, make reservations for the youth because they they claim that they don't pay taxes and that these fiscal impacts would not impact them personally, or they won't be subject to these um, taxes. However, the San Diego Union Tribune has come out in, um, in support of Proposition 18 and has claimed that it is a good way for um, the younger voters to go out and place their votes on the ballot, especially because we're in a time where um, youth participate, uh, youth participation, especially in politics, is running at an all-time high, especially with looking at the Black Lives Matter protests all over um, the United States of America. I have added an additional slide to show you guys where you guys can get more information. Um, there's no um, website for yes on 18 or no on 18, but I have let you guys, ha I have listed the Progressive Voters Guide, the EIP, the League of Women's Voters, um, and the voter guide, guide as well as Sacramento Bee's um, website or um, article where they go in support for Proposition 18. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. All right, Vanessa, Nadine, let's hear about Proposition 19. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my name is Nadine Magallanes and my partner is Vanessa. And we have Proposition 19 uh, with the title of the Home Protection for Seniors, D Severely Disabled Families and Victims of Wildfire or Natural Disaster Act. On your ballot, you're gonna see it under its much shorter title, changes certain property tax rules, legislative constitutional amendment. So that's exactly what it is, it's an amendment um, seeking to amend Proposition 13, the Tax Limitation Initiative from 1978. This was previously attempted back in 2008 as Proposition 5, but it was overwhelmingly defeated by 19 points. So this proposition will affect primarily two groups, eligible homeowners, so homeowners over the age of 55 who are severely disabled or whose homes were destroyed by wildfire or natural disaster and then beneficiaries of inherited properties. So property passed down from parent to child or grandparent to grandchild. A no vote would leave the constitution as it is, where you can transfer um, your tax assessments to anywhere within the county to a home of equal or lesser value one time and allows the tax ass assessment on inherited homes, including those not used as your primary residence to be transferred from parent to child or grandparent to grandchild if the parent is deceased. A yes vote would amend the constitution by now allowing eligible homeowners 
homeowners to transfer their tax assessments anywhere within the state to a home more expensive and allow them this opportunity three times. And it would eliminate the tax exemption on inherited homes. So if you don't use that inherited property as your primary residence, property tax would be reassessed to market value, closing what's dubbed the Lebowski hole. Uh, so basically the benefit of possibly owning now a million dollar home and paying the property taxes that maybe your parents um, paid when they bought it in the 70s, uh, which can be a significant difference. Vanessa? So for uh, supporters of this prop, um, the supporters don't, sorry. So the supporters have a lot more money contributed to the prop as opposed to the, the people who oppose it. Um, the total is a little over four, uh, $40 million. Um, the two biggest contributors are, um, as you can see, um, realtor, realtor associations, which is kind of like, as the picture shows, it's a little suspicious. Um, in an uh, opinion piece, by the LA Times, by the board of um, the editorial board, they uh, go on to say that they parts of the of the prop that they like are that um, there's there's going to be more homes that sell each year, but um, uh, it's obviously more in they like a realtor associations gain more from this prop than almost anybody else. Um, they do refer to this prop as a uh, inheritance tax break. Um, the, the California professional firefighters also are a big contributor to this because uh, Yes on 19 claims that the benefit of this prop will be local com communities that will get a long term revenue of over $1 billion. Um, annually for fire protection, local governments and school districts. So they have like a vested interest in this prop. The next. Okay. And the three top expenditures of this prop are transfers between committees of the same candidate sponsor. The payee from this one is uh, yes on 19, which is $10 million. Uh, the second would be petition circulating, which uh, the payee is from the 2020 Ball Camp LLC, which is over $1 million. And for TV or cable airtime and production cost, the payee would be Strother Knuckles Strategy LLC. And that is like a much lower punch, uh, contribution of $330,600. But over overall, they kind of over power the, the opposing people of Prop 19. And I'll talk a little bit about the those in opposition to Prop 19. It was entirely funded by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And they actually only, can, the only amount they raised was 45, around $45,000. So drastically different than the 45 million in support. Other groups in opposition include the League of Women Voters of California, the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, and the Friends Committee on Legislation of California. And I just included some snippets of what people are saying, that it really does nothing to help low-income seniors or families struggling to find housing. Um, it eliminates protections, tax, tax protections of transfers between family members, takes away important protections that have been in our constitution since 1986. And it's just a, the California real estate industry bringing back a failed idea um, with a dressed up appeal. And here we have our resources if you wanna check them out for some more information. I think that covers it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ethan, Jessica? Would you like to uh, talk about uh, Proposition 20, Prop 20?
Is your, are you, are you muted? Are you good? Yeah, I was muted, sorry. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Jessica and me and my partner Ethan will be going over Proposition 20. Uh, Proposition 20 is the Criminal Sentencing Parole and DNA Col Collection Initiative. Proposition 20 is an initiative California amendment ballot measure, meaning that someone wishes to amend the state constitution. The purpose of this proposition is to limit the number of parolees for crimes that are considered to be nonviolent. Next slide. Uh, additionally, this proposition deals with categorizing DNA for nonviolent offenders, specifically those convicted of grand theft, drug possession, and domestic violence charges. Voting yes supports this proposition, which adds crime to the list, crime to the list of violent felonies, which will result will result in the restriction of the ability for for early parole. It also reclassifies certain types of theft and fraud crimes, which may be considered misdemeanors. This also means that DNA collections will be required for certain misdemeanors. The history behind Proposition 20 is this ballot initiative would significant, significantly modify a number of criminal sentencing sentencing and laws that were passed between the years of 2011 and 2016. These include law AB 109, which changed the, sorry, the California Public Safety Realignment Act of 2011. It involved parole jurisdiction from the state the state level to the local level, and it also includes the 2014 Proposition 47, which downgraded nonviolent crimes from being felonies to, mis to misdemeanors, and also 2016 Proposition 57, which was passed to evolve public oh. safety. It changed parole laws, nonviolent offenders of certain crimes, and they would have a higher opportunity for parole. Next. So some of the supporters for Prop 20, um, obviously law enforcement and um, correctional officials are in support of this law because um, if Prop 20 passes, there's gonna be more need for regulations and more need for correctional officers in prison. So, um, it's actually going to increase the spending that we give to um, our prison institutions, thus positively affecting correctional officers and other members of law enforcement. So um, they are in support of this proposition. Um, some politicians that are also in favor um, include uh, SM Lemon Jim Cooper, um, Congressman Devin Nunes, um, and pretty much the entire Democratic um, Republican Party, at least those who are um, in elected office. Um, the majority of them are proposition. Um, some of the people that are in opposition to this prop are educators, people in the um, mental health arena. Um, part of the reason that they're against this proposition is because of the um, addition to mental health being um, a deciding factor and whether people go on parole or not. So mental health officials don't agree that that should be um, a tool because they're used that's going to be used in a negative way that um, disenfranchises those with mental health problems. Um, other people that are against it are um, public uh, people in the public health sector um, and then homeless caretakers as well. Um, some people in uh, the political arena who are, are in opposition to this um, proposition are our current governor, Gavin Newsom, and former governor, um, Jerry Brown. Part of the reason that Jerry Brown is against this is because he kind of led the 2016 proposition that... Um, change prison reform. Um, so he's kind of trying to fight to keep that proposition alive because it's currently threatened by um, Prop 20. And then the ACLU is also against this proposition because they believe that it is going to um, continually disenfranchise 
um, people in prison who are already disenfranchised. So, uh, um, so some of the contributing players. Um, so there's been a total of $8.6 million put into the proposition. It's not the largest pop by any means, but it's also not a small amount. Um, so there's supporting factors. It's a lot of um, typical associations that we see for a proposition like this, um, where it gets really interesting, at least for me as a political science major, is the opposing side. So the top two players that we see on uh, for the opposing contributions, Patty Quillen, and then the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So for those of you who don't recognize the first name, I don't blame you. I did not recognize it either. either. But she's actually the spouse of um, Netflix is CEO. And then the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is led by Zuckerberg. So the two key players on the opposition side are leading tech moguls, or are at least the spouse of leading tech moguls. Um, this is something that kind of perplexed me during my research, and I couldn't really figure out exactly why um, they were so involved in this proposition. And the only theory that I was able to come up with is that they want more more people out of prison, right? So they're, support, they're in opposition to something that's going to make goal harder, thus keeping people in prison because they just want more use. Um, again, that's just my personal theory. I wasn't able to really find any um, hard evidence on why they oppose this specific proposition. Um, so the total amount of money for um, the supporting side of this is somewhere around $2.6 million. Um, and the opposing side almost doubles that with around $5 million. Um, and some immediate take on this. Um, so I use these two um, media chronicles because I think they really represent both sides of this argument pretty well. Um, so the San Diego Union Tribune um, is in support of Prop 20 because they believe that Prop 20 is um, a proposition that fights for safety in neighborhoods and safety in communities. So um, the San Diego Tribune kind of goes about, we want our daily lives safer. We want to walk the streets and feel safer because we don't want as many blows on the street, right? Because we don't want people convicted of nonviolent crimes living in our neighborhoods, right? Because we want to feel safe. And that's kind of the avenue that the San Diego Tribune goes down and other news articles that um, support the proposition all figure it out. The San Francisco Chronicle, however, takes kind of a different route. And they say that this history that we've had from um, the past decade of prison reform is one that we should follow. Is not, it's not one that we should step back. We shouldn't be reverting back to 1980s and 1990s prison reform where we were punishing people for originally being convicted of a crime, right? We should be trying to rehabilitate and trying to get people integrated back into society, which um, they believe was part of what propositions were doing in the last decade. And they believe that Prop 20 is kind of reverting back to, to those 1980s and 1990s punishment upon punishment laws. Yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will hopefully get to them at the end. Thank you. All right, thank you both very much. Carlos, Audrey, let's hear about Proposition 21. Let me just get my screen pulled up. Okay, there we go. Thank you. My name is Audrey, and Carlos and I will be um, talking about Proposition 21 tonight. Um, Proposition 21 is the local rent control initiative, and if it is passed, it would allow limits on annual rent increases to differ from current statewide limits. So the proposition has four main components. First, it would amend state law to allow local governments to establish rent control on residential properties over 15 years old. Second, it would allow rent increases in rent controlled properties of up to 15% over three years at the start of a new tenancy. Third, it would exempt individuals who own no more than two homes from new rent control properties. So these are sometimes in the media, um, mom and pop landlords. And then finally, to remain in accordance with existing California law, it would prohibit rent control policies from violating landlords right to fair financial returns. 
Um, the largest unattended uh, consequence of this ballot measure, if it passes, would be the fiscal impact. Um, the measure could lead to a to decreases in property tax, and the legislative analyst office estimates a potential reduction in state and local revenues in the high tens of millions of dollars per year over time. But these revenue losses could be increased or diminished depending on how local communities implement the law. Um, and then for the total support and opposition contributions and expenditures, which we're both going to get into in more detail, but as you can see, the opposition committee has taken in more contributions and has had more expenditures than the support committee. And um, this information is as of last Friday afternoon, um, and it's from the Secretary of State's website. So um, the proposition is supported by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. By California Congresswoman Maxine Waters, um, the California Nurses Association, the California Democratic Party, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, who is the sponsor of the proposition, and as you see, the biggest um, support donor. That's the bottom graph. So we made up about 99% of total contributions. And then the support committee has spent $17.4 million so far on expenditures and about 80% of these expenditures have been in the top three categories, which are information technology costs, petition circulating, and cable airtime production cost. Okay, so um, although there, there are big names, you know, who support uh, Proposition 21, uh, there are also names who uh, oppose it, such as uh, Governor Newsom and the Republican Party of California. Um, as you can see right below, uh, all right, on this on the slide, um, the major contributors uh, to to this campaign opposing uh, Prop 21 uh, were Essex Property Trust Incorporated. Uh, they contributed about 6.6 .6 million. Uh, the California Business Roundtable Issues Pack uh, contributed 5.6 million. Equity Residential at 5.5 million. Avalon Bay Communities Incorporated at 4.3 million. So. Uh, in total, they accumulate, accumulated over uh, a little bit over $22 million, and that equates equates to about 54.8% uh, 54 of the total contributions on the opposing side. Um, and also, I didn't, uh, I forgot to, I didn't uh, add it on the slide, but um, I came across this uh, like public opinion poll, um, like a study survey done by UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies that was uh, published actually last month. And uh, the results were that um, that 37% uh, uh, supported Proposition 21, and, uh, another 37% opposed Proposition 21, and 26% were still um, undecided. They weren't sure. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. That concludes our presentation. And here's a slide for if you guys want more information on Prop 21. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you both very much. All right, uh, let's hear from uh, Catherine and Cameron. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen here and bring it up. Give me just a minute here. <clears throat> Catherine and Cameron, I think we're all set. Okay, um, hi, my name is Catherine Breer. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior at Sonoma State. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about Prop 22, um, or as it is formally called on your ballot, exempts app-based transportation and delivery companies from providing employee benefits to certain drivers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this problem is on the ballot now as a result of California Assembly Bill 5, which was signed in September 2019 and has been effective since January 2020. Um, this bill established a three-factor test to determine if a company can classify an employee as an independent contractor. And the, the distinction between these um, affects wages and rights of, that, of the employee in different ways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what does a yes vote mean? Uh, yes on 22 would mean that you support um, rideshare and app-based delivery companies such as Uber and Lyft being able to classify their workers as independent contractors. 
which would mean that these companies have an exemption from uh, California Assembly Bill 5. Uh, this would mean drivers would be entitled to uh, minimum earnings, healthcare subsidies, and vehicle insurance. Uh, and the CEO of Uber says that this will give drivers more freedom with their own work schedules. Uh, some supporters of Yes on 22 are Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, uh, the California Republican Party, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the State Sheriff's Association, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Next slide. Uh, so what would a no vote mean on this? No on 22 would mean that you do not want rideshare and app-based delivery companies to have a special exemption from AB5. Drivers classified as employees uh, have rights to minimum wage, overtime, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, and the right to unionize. Opponents who endorse no on 22 are Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Gig Workers Rising, California Teachers Association, and the LA Times. Companies like Uber have stated that if Prop 22 does not pass, then fares will rise along with wait times as their personal business model does not support paying drivers as anything but independent contractors. I'm now going to pass it off to my partner who will discuss the funding behind this talk. Hello, uh, my name's Cameron. I'm a political science junior at Sonoma State. Uh, so this is the most expensive um, ballot proposition really in our history um, at 185 million in contributions to the yes campaign. Um, and they've already spent 117 million of that. So in the beginning, they spent about uh, 1.6 million on gathering uh, signatures and uh, or sorry, 6.5, 6.6 million uh, to the National Petition Management on gaining signatures at about $4 per signature. Uh, so this was in early October of last year. Um, and then the next step was like legal counsel. Um, so this is where this group, uh, Nielsen, Merksimer, Parnello, Gross, and Leon comes in at almost a million dollars. And what this group specializes in is writing um, their bill language or proposition language to be uh, confusing and misleading um, and make it a, a difficult decision to make. Um, and then the next thing that uh, they did after that was some early stage polling and research. Um, they used about 20 or 30 different um, agencies uh, testing the waters with each, each receiving around a million to two million. Uh, but then they settled on Target Enterprises um, earlier in October uh, for 82 million. Um, and this is where uh, the like video advertising has come in. So if you see the advertises saying to vote yes on Prop 22. Uh, this is from Target Enterprises. Uh, and a lot of how they're doing this is by um, getting actual Uber and Lyft drivers to appear on these commercials, uh, stating why this is in their best interest. A few other things is um, Baker, Castillo and Fairbanks um, is a company that they hired just for running their Twitter at a half million dollars. Um, as well as dealing with media um, and another group, MB Public Affairs, um, paid around 300,000, has been well known working on like far right uh, campaigns in the past and uh, is known for digging up dirt on political opponents. And in this current um, proposition, they've stirred up, um, I guess, drama about um, different uh, journalist writing opposition pieces um, and has made their job more difficult. So you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the No on 22 campaign has received a lot less money. This is uh, in, in normal campaigns, usually the No campaign um, is the one that is outspending and receiving more money. Uh, so this one is a rarity in that regard. Um, so 12 million in contributions, and they've only spent 1.8 million of it. 
Um, so 565,000 to American Media Strategies, um, this Fairbank, Maislin, Mollen, Metz, and Associates uh, has actually worked on both uh, the No on 22 and the Yes on 22 campaign, um, working on advertising, polling, and research. Um, and then Kaufman campaign consultants. So the big spending for both has been campaign consulting, strategizing, um, and then advertising. But the majority of the No on 22 uh, advertising really has been done by articles written uh, by independent journalists. So you can go on to the next. Uh, so for more information, uh, this is where I got all the uh, info about campaign funding as well as for all the other propositions. That's, that's it. All right, thank you very much. Okay, that was Proposition 22. Charles, let's hear from you on Proposition 23. Good evening, everyone. Hold on, let me share my screen. Kind of got too motivated there. Okay, uh, tonight I'm here to talk to you about Proposition 23. My name is Charles Bordy. I am a junior of political science here at Sonoma State University. If Prop 23 succeeds, it's going to require the staffing of a physician in dialysis clinics while patients are being treated. It's going to require dialysis clinics to report data on dialysis-related infections to the state. It will require providers to consult the state before permanently closing a dialysis clinic. And it will forbid clinics from um, discriminating on basis of source of payment. So. A, having private insurance shouldn't get you a dialysis appointment before Medi-Cal should. Opponents argue that it will raise healthcare costs, and they suggest that Prop 23 is kind of an attempt to politicize an ongoing uh, battle with um, an ongoing battle to unionize dialysis clinics. Uh, the state predicts minimal impact to the taxpayer, citing the cost to the state in the low tens of millions annually. Uh, on the support side, we have two committees, but one's kind of defunct. It's given all of its money to the other. So today we're only going to be focusing on Yes on 23, Californians for Kidney Dialysis Patient Protection, sponsored by Serviced Employees International Union, United Healthcare Workers West. Uh, the, Democrat, uh, the California Democratic Party has also made a financial donation in support. In opposition, we have another committee, uh, No on 23, Stop the Dangerous and Costly Dialysis Proposition, a coalition of dialysis providers, nurses, doctors, and patients. They've also received at least symbolic support from AMVETS, the American Legion, the California Medical Association, and the NAACP. As far as finances go, um, as you can see on this nifty little graph I made, um, the opposition is by far out earning the support side. Uh, the opponents have raised just over $93 million, while supporters have raised only $6.1 million, which sounds like a lot, but in, in races like this, it's really not. Um, as far as who's donating to the support side, uh, the vast majority of their donations have come from uh, SEIU Healthcare Workers West. Uh, specifically, the Political Issues Committee has given just over $5.5 million. Uh, the union itself has given another $646,000. And uh, the California Democratic Party has donated just under $1,300. Um, the support side has mainly spent their money on petition circulation. Uh, that's their biggest. That's their biggest expenditure um, at about five point five million dollars. Following in second would be staff time at about half a million dollars, and then office expenses at just under thirty thousand dollars. So they're not doing a whole lot to get their message out. Um, these are the groups donating in opposition. Uh, they're all major um, healthcare providers or, or dialysis providers. Uh, Davita Inc. has spent just under $60 million. Uh, Fresenius Medical Care 
has donated just over $26 million. U.S. Renal Care Inc., just over $6.8 million. And Dialysis Clinic Inc. has spent uh, almost $394,000. And this is where it gets interesting for me as a poli-sci major, is um, when we look at how much money is being spent on TV and radio production costs, Uh, We see that the opposition has spent about 80% of their budget on this, but what really floored me was that um, the 75 million that they've spent on TV and radio costs is still more than 10 times what the support side has even earned um, total. So it still exceeds, it it exceeds them by a factor of 10. Um, Following up next would be campaign literature and mailings. Uh, at just over 2.4 million and campaign consulting at just under 1.4 million. Uh, For more information, please check the following sources. Um, And again, please vote. Thank you. Charles, thank you very much. I'm gonna move it right over to George Henry on Prop 24. We're gonna, uh, Charles, stop sharing your screen so we can, uh... all right. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, George Henry. Okay, just making sure you guys can hear me. Thank you. And you started your screen share. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I, there you go. You can see it. Yes, we're good. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is George Henry. I'm a senior here at uh, Sonoma State, and uh, today I'll be discussing Proposition Twenty Four or the Consumer Personal Information Law and Agency Initiative. So Prop 24, uh, it seeks to expand a previous bill that was passed in 2018 called the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. Uh, it would sort, it would add on to the law that was passed then with a couple of extra provisions. It would uh, get rid of an, the ability for businesses to sort of fix uh, what they're doing wrong and violating the bill from 2018. Uh, there would also be more restrictions on how they can collect data. For example, they could no longer collect uh, data on uh, people who are younger than the age of 13 without their parents' permission. Uh, and this goes all the way up to 16. Uh, it gives uh, users uh, more control over the data by sort of allowing them to tell uh, businesses to fix the data they find wrong. And one of the big things that it will do is create the California Privacy and Protection Agency, which would help enforce the privacy laws that are already on the books and would help enforce any future laws that are passed. Uh, George Henry, I think, I think your screen might be frozen here. Oh, hello? Uh, yeah, I think your screen might be frozen. I'm gonna take it off. Oh, okay. Okay, so can you take it off? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on uh, my screen, okay? okay. For your, uh, for your measure. So hold on just a second. We'll get us right there to 24 and right where you were at. I think, were you right yeah, here? I was, yeah, I just finished talking about that page. I was just about to start on uh, why does Prop 24 exist. Okay, thank you. Let's pick thank up you. there. Uh, so why, why is this on the ballot? Well, referring back to the initial privacy bill of 2018, it was not, uh, originally it was actually a ballot measure. Uh, I believe it was Prop 13. But uh, originally, the governor at the time, Jerry Brown, passed a very watered-down version of it, which was the Privacy Act of 2018. And basically, this proposition is to sort of get the rest of the bill that didn't pass uh, on the ballot measure, and that's what we're basically voting on. Uh, Can I go to the next page, please? Gotcha. So who are the people who support this bill? Uh, well, uh, I think we should look at the, uh, the finances real quick. If you notice at the top, there's a man named Alistair McTaggart who has raised well over $5 million for this. And that is actually 90, over 95% of all money raised on this ballot initiative from both sides. So he is the man who's sort of dominating the... Uh, this push for the ballot. Uh, and then if you look at the, the people underneath him who have donated, it's, they don't even total $15,000. Uh, 
And uh, if we go to, and of course, who is this Alistair McTaggart fellow? Uh, he is the chairman of the Californians for Consumer Privacy. They are the main group pushing for Prop 24. And back in 2018, they were actually the people who originally proposed that proposition that would become the then uh, the then California's Privacy Act of uh, 2018. And this has gotten a couple of major endorsements. The biggest one that I could find was uh, former presidential candidate Andrew Yang. Uh, and there's been several other groups that have done it, that have uh, supported this, such as Common Sense, which is a California consumer rights privacy group, and uh, Consumer Watchdog, which is sort of a not necessarily California, but it's a countrywide consumer advocacy, advocacy group. And there have been some other people who have uh, supported this proposition, including uh, six, uh, s- uh, five uh, state representatives and one House representative. And uh, they've also received support from the uh, CEA and NAACP uh, state conference. And uh, yeah, for who is against it, there are actually two groups, but as mentioned before, they have not raised a lot of money. In fact, between the two of them, they've not even raised uh, $50,000. Uh, and uh, the first group is the California Consumer Privacy Advocates Against Prop 24. And uh, those are the two donations I could find and the California's for Real Privacy. And that's, that's the one group that's been donating to them. Uh, and for endorsements, it's gotten endorsements from the California Republican Party, the ACLU of California and Northern California, Consumer Action, Consumer Federation of California, which are uh, consumer at, consumer right groups, the League of Women's Voters of California, Media Alliance. There have been also other endorsements such as CA Nurse, Nurses Association, which is a union, Color of Change, which is a civil rights group, and several others. And those are the expenses on the side. And uh, if you have any more information, I recommend you look at these sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George Henry. All right, uh, Guadalupe, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Proposition Twenty Five, please. Yeah, totally. Let me just get the screen ready. And. All right, perfect. Hi, I'm Guadalupe Hernandez again, and I'm going to talk about Proposition 25 tonight. Um, And Proposition 25 is a referendum on the law that replaced monetary bail with a system based on public safety and flight risk. So um, in a nutshell, or just in general, um, this proposition is a referendum on 2018 Senate bill Um, 10 that Jerry Brown signed in 2018. And its um, main objective is to advance meaningful criminal justice reform that avoids penalizing the poor defendants. Um, Moreover, um, this proposition, it um, specifically rids California of the entire bail bond industry because we're not using monetary bail anymore. We, We would be using risk assessments if Proposition 25 passed. So going forward, um, Proposition 25 is, again, a referendum to Senate Bill 10. Um, It's projected to cost California taxpayers an estimated mids of hundreds of millions of dollars annually, and these costs would be allocated to local courts to adjust to the new process of risk release assessments. Um, And if passed, Proposition, well, first of all, the mids of hundreds of um, millions of dollars is, again, a very small percentage of California's budget, but if passed, Proposition 25 would also save taxpayers an untold tens of millions of dollars by reducing the number of defendants that we have awaiting trial. Simultaneously, it's it's estimated to increase state revenues because um, the detained defendants would be out um, working and paying taxes, which would add on to state revenue. Um, If not passed, California will continue to have an active bail bond industry and taxpayers will continue to pay for poor defendants um, that are awaiting trial in prison. So moving forward, why, what is stopping California to build meaningful criminal justice reform? And um, the answer is the $3 billion bail bond industry that we have nationally and 
one fourth of its profits um, of the $3 billion is made specifically in California. So it makes sense that an entire industry would not want to leave without a fair um, or unfair fight. Um, so also there's concerns over the proposition's impact on crime and racial inequalities, which I will show, I, I will explain the um, graph on the side. Also, the there's um, a lot of misleading information about how risk release assessments look like in practice, which could um, also influence voters when voting on Prop 25. On the side, I have a Public Policy Institute of California's graph, um, and it shows how African Americans would be far more likely than other people of other races to be held for risk release assessments. The orange is um, no assessment at all, and because the reason why they don't get assessments is because those are felonies, and um, people that um, have committed a felony or are in prison for a felony would not be eligible for risk release assessment. Um, but all the blue would be um, for assessments that would be made um, with exclusion, um, nonviolent felonies, and violent felonies. So I think I might have read something wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, moving forward, contributions to campaign supporters and opponents. Nearly $15 million have been raised up to now. Um, $8 million have been um, raised by the opposition, which have made 54%, and $6 million, nearly $7 million um, for the supporters of Proposition 25. So who is for Prop 25? Um, Governor Newsom, California Democratic Party have endorsed Proposition 25. Included, in the, included with them is um, the top contributors for the committee. Um, which is Stephen A. Balmer and Connie E. Balmer, which have garnered five, close to $5 million altogether. Um, the SEIU California State Council nonprofit has um, raised $500,000, as well as the Action Now Initiative um, has also um, contributed $500,000, and Patty Quillen, um, $250,000. Um, on the side, there's the top three committees expenditures first the supporters and we see that they um, spend the most on campaign consultants and also polling and survey research as well as inform information and technology costs. Um, all this information was on the California Secretary of State website. Um, moving forward for the against Proposition 25. So the California Republican Party and organizations such as the NAACP and the Human Rights Watch organizations are against Proposition 25. Um, the biggest contributors are insurance companies such as Triton Management Services, Bankers Insurance Company, AIA Holdings, American Surety Company, and Lexington National Insurance Company. And there's a big disparity on expenditures between um, the supporters and the opposition. We see that they have their biggest expenditure has been, or their largest expenditure has been the $1 million contribution that the committee has um, given to the California Republican Party back in September. Um, also, they spend on campaign consultants, 769,000, as well as campaign literature and mailing, um, $702,000. Um, moving forward. Uh, I just want to talk about um, how uh, oh shoot. how um, the bail bond industries have made a really big push on the California Republican Party to say no to uh, uh, Proposition 25, as well as they had an expenditure, although small, um, towards uh, the signatures for the re for the referendum of Senate Bill 10. Um, and I have more information if y'all like would like to check it out. Um, we have yes on California Prop 25, the Cal Access campaign measures to be more updated on the numbers, but the uh, numbers have been updated since this Monday and as well as um, the endorsements from uh, newspapers and media from the Berkeley Institute and all that jazz. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guadalupe. All right, um, we're gonna change gears here just a little bit. Uh, we're gonna hear from Evan and Stephanie on measures O and P that are on the Sonoma County ballot. So first uh, we're gonna turn to Evan. I'm gonna pull up my screen here, Evan. So uh, we can pull up your, your slides here. Bear with me just a second, here we go. 
Evan, here you go. Measure O, you're up. <clears throat> you might be you might be muted. There you go. You're off mute. Okay. Measure O is a uh, part of the county. Of, it's a ballot in Sonoma County. Um, it's for mental health, addiction, homeless services, measure transactions, and the use of tax ordinance. Slide. Basically, the purpose of Measure O is to provide expanded mental health and addiction services, including both the services and permanent and permanent facilities across the affected population, including the homeless. This is a sales tax initiative financed by one fourth cent tax on transactions to last for 10 years. It would raise proposed 25 million for a period ending in April 1, 2021. Slide. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Pros are local members of Congress, education administrators, city council members, and assorted health and educational professionals. I'm sorry, I don't have more examples, but uh, cons are county taxpayers association, pro business associations, such as the Chamber of Commerce and trade organizations. Um, newspaper coverage, Regarding Measure O was found in the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, the Sonoma Gazette, and the North Bay Bohemian. The two, the first two supported a yes vote, surprisingly, but the North Bay Bohemian was reserved with questions about vagueness and actual spending and oversight. Um, so the strategy behind O. Um, County supervisors do not want to be seen to reduce services as the public is affected and vocal about the local impact. However, this is a time of revenue shortfall. So the soups may also wish to pen their unfunded liability vis-a-vis -vis pensions. And that is more immediate impact profile that distracts from that. The supporters need to be seen to be doing it the public interest and believe that the revenue stream from transactions will consolidate their positions and net of favors owed to them to preserve their political preservability. <clears throat> so I had trouble um, finding Financial information on Measure O is very ambiguous. Uh, I challenge you to find some. Um, all you have to do is click that link and find Measure O. And, you know, it was definitely written by attorneys. So, next. <clears throat> A yes or no means expanded access to services for urgent and continuing care to Sonoma County residents in need of mental health, addiction treatment, and the creation of facilities in which to deliver these services. And no on O means without passing O, current services due to the recommended po reference population already in inadequate will likely be further reduced. Senator Mike McGuire got an exception to the sales tax cap should this measure pass, if not the cap remains in place. Uh, my personal opinion, actually I'm on the fence. I've been doing a lot of thinking about it. It's uh, it, homelessness is actually something that hits pretty close to home for me. Um, so, but at the time I, I wrote, I'd vote no because Measure O is a well-intended but badly written, you know, there's a, loss and accountability and oversight loose and the timing is terrible for additional sales tax even though it is one four cent uh, it could have the unintended consequence of actually increasing the homeless population kind of like uh, the tenderloin uh, the need for mental health and addiction services will not go away in four years but by then the economy may be more secure and even hopefully the county may also have improved their position on 
unfunded pension liabilities, which is one of the big deals about it is it's kind of like, well, where is all the money going to go? So a bad law and a good cause is never worth it. Mesero is well intended, well intended, but written at the wrong time. But I don't know. Evan, I might thank vote you. yes. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Evan. Appreciate it. Okay, Stephanie, you're our last person. Thank you, Evan, there, Stephanie. Measure P. Go ahead and make it lar as large as you can there for the screenshot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm going to cover Measure P. Okay, Name is County of Sonoma Measure P Changes Law Enforcement Review Board. So a little bit of background on Measure P. The Measure P would enhance the oversight authority of independence of IOLERO program to review and analyze complaints against the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. It would expand the role and independence of the Community Advisor Council so that they would be able to obtain records and witness statements as well as require a review of the program for its performance and duties. So the Iolero program was created as a response to the tragic death of Andy Lopez by Sonoma County Sheriff's deputy that took place on October 22nd in 2013 here in Santa Rosa, California. So 13 year old Andy Lopez was walking around carrying an air soft gun that was resembled to an AK-47 assault rifle. Sonoma County Sheriff's deputy opened fire on Andy Lopez, make the assumption that the airsoft gun was a real firearm. So because of the shooting, it took a big toll on the community and it resulted in protests around Santa Rosa as well as Cal different parts in California. So due to the single event, there was a movement within the community towards the creation of the Independent Office of Law Enforcement Review and Outreach, which is the IOLERO program. So Measure P is also dedicated to Evelyn Chapman's hard work, um, she, which um, she unfortunately died in 2013. Um, the intention of the program was to help change and prevent a repeat of any family, especially in our local community from suffering from tragic events. Um, she worked hard to create a program that would have civilian oversight of the agency in order to create and conduct unbiased audits of sheriff's office investigations. So a yes vote on Measure P would require the director of the IOLERO program to be qualified as a certified practitioner of oversight by the Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. It would prohibit the director's removal unless approved by a four-fifths voter vote of the board supervision. It would authorize access to all investigative evidence, contact witness and subpoena records. It would also impose deputies duties of the sheriff's corner and require corporate cooperation within the IOLERO program. It would require performance audits as well as the set the office budget at 1% of the total budget um, in order in order to, um, to budget for the sheriff's corner. Um, so a couple supporters of Measure P would include Sonoma County Democratic Party, um, Sonoma County Black Coalition, Sonoma County Latino Democratic Club, the National Organization for Women's. Um, so a couple of these of members of the community that would include that would support this would be Jerry Threat, which is the former director of IOLERO, um, the North Bay 
organizing project, the Green Party and the ACLU. Um, a no vote on measure P would allow for existing code provisions governing Iolero to stay the same. So essentially it would not do anything and just keep um, the program running as it is. A couple of posers of the program would be Sonoma County's law enforce, enforcement, um, Daniel Evans, the president of Sonoma County's Deputy Sheriff's Association, um, Michael Vale. Couple campaign contributions and expenditures. So most of this campaign is running through um, donations of independent um, people. So a top five contributors um, are listed down below. And you can see that as of um, up to date, as of September 19, 2020, there has been a total of $88,921.84 contributed to the measure to support P. And for more information, you can go ahead and check out any of these resources down below. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So I know it's late. Uh, so what I'd like to do is we, we do have a number of questions that came in. We'd like to address some of those, but I'm going to also ask the students to follow up uh, with many of those questions with you directly via email. So, but we're going to answer questions here in just a second. We received a bunch, put those together. But what I'd like to do is, is Deborah, I'd like to go to you, if you would, please, uh, to say a few words about the work the league's doing in relationship to this election. And then Merith, I'd like to go to you. Uh, to kind of close out things. We'll stay and grab a few questions, but that'll give people also an opportunity if they want to depart uh, as well. So Deborah, would you like to say a few things? Yeah, I'll do a quick uh, screen share with uh, contact information for us. And um, we want to encourage everybody who wants to get more information on the propositions to go to our YouTube channel, because we have also done pros and cons on each one of the ballot measures, including the local measures. So you can get more information there if you want it. We also have this year done candidate nights for all the city and town council races. So you can see, view those on our YouTube channel. And a resource that you can go to for information about everything that's on your ballot is votersedge.org. That's put out by the California League. So we have a lot of information to help you get through this process. You can go to our website and that has uh, dates for the ballots to be turned in, has other kinds of deadlines, and it also has a place where you can sign up to track your ballot. A lot of people are worried this year, if I put my ballot in the mail, is it really going to get there? If I oh, too bad. I sounded a little nervous, huh? Whoop. Sorry yeah. about that. Sorry, so, Stephanie. Uh, so people are nervous about whether the ballot's going to be received, and the Secretary of State actually has put together a program where you can track your ballot, and there's information on that at our website and also on our Facebook page. So I encourage you to check out the League of Women Voters website, Facebook page, and Voters Edge, and get all the information you need before you vote. And thanks a lot for doing this tonight. It was very informative. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. I really appreciate that and, and all the support of the league. You guys are doing just fantastic work there uh, and we, we are happy to be part of it and also want to encourage everyone to check out the fantastic resources that the league has there, uh, especially the YouTube videos, what's going on and the ability, ability to track your ballot. Merith, would you like to uh, say a few words uh, about the CCE and the work we're doing and up upcoming programs perhaps? I would. Um, thank you. And so first thing, I want to thank the students and Dave from um, Paul's 484. I look forward to this every two years. And now I feel comfortable. I can go vote tomorrow. I feel confident that I know what I'm doing. So thank you so much. And I also, um, is my slide showing? It's not, it's not showing here right now. There it is. There it is right there. Okay. It's not letting me make it full screen now. Yes. There it is. Great. Thank it's you. And I also want to thank the um, staff and the CCE. Uh, 
Caroline Bonuelos and Ashley Simon. This is not something that, you know, Dave and me pulled off on our own. This is quite a, an effort. And so I want to thank everybody for everybody who showed up and everybody who, um, who helped make this happen. We did have 250 people here tonight. So that just goes to show. And so please do not forget to vote. And for those of you Sonoma State students and, um, and faculty and staff, join us the day after the election, Wednesday, November 4th, for a debrief of what happened. Um, and also Caps will be here in case we're not all feeling great that day. Um, and so you will need to register for this. There's a link there to register. I'm also going to put that link in the chat as soon as I'm done speaking because you can't click on it here. Um, so I just really want to thank everybody and I'm looking forward to seeing you on November 4th. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, let's let's get to some of your questions. So uh, we had a number of questions about Proposition 15. Uh, really uh, not surprising uh, in, in that regard. And and so I'm going to put forward uh, two questions to the Prop 15 team. Well, one is about uh, leases and and how leases are handled uh, under the split role measure. And and but let's before we go to leases, let's start with an easier question. Uh, why is Mark Zuckerberg uh, supporting uh, Proposition 15? Emily? Yeah, great. I can start off for the both of us. So um, one thing to note about um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Chan, is their charity and philanthropy efforts are for improving education and housing within the community. So this is actually an interesting that he would even be involved with this because he's not had very good luck with politics in any other neck of the woods in the political realm. Um, he um, it's also important to note that it's backed by the Silicon Valley Rising Action Coalition for Economic and Social Justice. And so there's a lot of conversations within the Silicon Valley and um, within the tech industry. A lot of these giants are actually supporting this. Um, and prop um, the Yes on Prop 15 campaign is really ran with this narrative as well, um, that you know, large, large industries and large companies do need to be taxed a little more and be able to provide for our community. Um, and so the yes campaign narrative really runs with the fact that these taxes are going to be put back into our community, specifically for schools, and um, not only K through 12, but also community colleges within our communities in California. Um, so that's a little bit about why um, Zuckerberg chose to back this proposition. There's been a lot of articles about it because, you know, folks that think um, big corporations wouldn't want to support this, of course, um, everyone first looking at this prop would, would think that. Um, but there's three phenomenal pieces done by, there's one, the LA Times, Daily News, and even Vox, that's an easier read, um, all kind of break down why he's a big supporter for this proposition. And he's spent a well over $10 million on it. He's one of the largest contributions. And he's also one of the oldest contributions. He's been supporting it since day one. Thank you very much. Uh, Will, do you want to talk about some of the, the leases or some aspects of, of the lease arrangements in Proposition 15? It gets a little bit complicated, but uh, maybe you should take a swing at it. Uh, yes, I would like to do that. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to define what uh, triple net lease is, uh, for those who may not know, because I had to look it up the first time I heard about it. Uh, triple net lease is a provision in which the uh, lease includes provisions that the renter has to pay property taxes and all uh, costs associated with the property. Now, if a business rents one portion of a building, such as multiple businesses in a strip mall, each business pays a portion uh, of the property tax of the property costs uh, in proportion with their the space that they take up in the strip mall. Um, so the concern about triple net leases in Prop 15 is that because the uh, property taxes are not paid by the property owners, that Prop 15 will directly bypass the owners and affect small businesses, drive, potentially driving them out of business. At least this is what the opposition claims as will happen. Um, now that is potentially true. There is some potential to that scenario. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, a study by the Blue Sky Consulting Group, which was admittedly com uh, commissioned by the supporters of Prop 15, shows that only about 
one in 10 properties are going to be affected by the uh, Prop 15 requirements. So most businesses and most uh, commercial properties are not going to be affected. So there's already a low chance that it's going to impact um, businesses just on the numbers side of how many properties will be affected. Um, but there's also the fact that um, this is phased in over five years. So the impact on the lease agreements, uh, businesses will have about five years to potentially renegotiate those agreements with their landlords. Um, in California, the reason triple net leases are important to consider is that most uh, commercial properties that do rent out do use this kind of triple net lease agreement. It's very common in California. So a lot of businesses would have to consider that uh, if this proposition were to pass. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Noor, uh, do you wanna hit one of our students there with a question? Sure, yeah, there were a couple more. Sorry, there's a list in here. <laughs> Me I think there was a question about Prop uh, 16 for Sarah. Sarah, um, asking if HSI, I believe, is Hispanic serving institution. Correct me if I'm wrong. So how does that calculate? How does that work in um, with Prop 16? Thank you. I'm not muted, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, so. Um, Yes, Sonoma State is an H HSI school. That means um, a Hispanic serving institute. In order for an institute to be deemed HSI, there um, there has to be a student population of over 25% Hispanics. And um, how would Prop 16 change this? The way Sonoma State would be able, or any HSI um, school would be able to accept gifts or scholarships for their students, would be much wider and the way they could um, administer these gifts and scholarships would be different because they could use um, race and sex to, to um, administer these um, gifts or um, scholarships. Also, um, like I said, it takes 25% or over of the current students for an institution to be deemed HSI. So when you look at schools like UCLA, where actually um, minority um, admission has collapsed a lot, um, Prop 16 would make a bigger impact in schools like Berkeley or US UCLA and not with schools that are already deemed HSI, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gabriel, do you want to put forward a question to one of our folks? Hold on, Gabriel, you might want to unmute. Sorry. There was some question about whether Prop 19 and the presentation about it was unbiased. And I'd like to know if Vanessa or Nadine would like to address that um, comment. Thank you. Nadine, Vanessa. One of you, you might be, you might be on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Nadine, is that you? Yeah, that's me. Yeah, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah, we were open to any feedback, but please feel free to vote whichever way you'd like. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, um, on, on Proposition 21, uh, Audrey and Carlos, uh, we had a, a couple of questions about rent control and, and whether or not, uh, what was the effect of this of setting a cap or not? 21 seems kind of confusing. And so we received a number of questions about the confusing nature of that. Could you clear up or provide any clarity about 21, rent control, setting caps, basis, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, so because of the time constraint, we didn't really get to get into the, um, the history that has kind of gone into this proposition, but um, essentially the current, like the existing rent control law in California says that rent control policies can't be enacted on any policy first, um, first occupied after February 1st, 1995. So the first part of Proposition 21 would allow rent control properties to be put onto new, or rent control policies to be implemented onto new properties. Um, 
um, because they currently can't be. And then the second part of it is that um, the current the existing law says that landlords um, can increase properties on rent controlled properties after the, a tenant has moved out to reflect market prices, which is where you kind of see these big jumps in the, the rent in a, in a building because it will be under rent control because it was occupied before 1995. And then when that tenant moves out, you see a, a substantial hike in the, the price of rent in that building because it no longer applies to the existing rent control law. So the other thing Proposition 21 would do would allow rent increases of up to 15% over three years at the start of a new tenancy instead of jumping just to, um, to market price. Um, so, and then as to who it benefits, I think was the second part of that question. So the goal of the measure is to address kind of the, the housing crisis in California and make rent more affordable. Um, so people on the opposition side say that obviously when you, you put rent control prices on, um, on buildings, then you're less likely to see these really high um, rent prices. But then people who are against the proposition say that this could potentially um, discourage uh, landlords from buying property and actually making make housing less affordable because there would be um, kind of less market interest in, in buying property and, and having it available to rent. Um, I will put my email address if there are any further questions in the chat and you can feel free to contact me. And then also um, there's a lot of good information on ballotpedia.org and calmatters.org if there are any, if anyone would like to do further research. Okay, Audrey, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, Mara, I, I see that you asked a question about Prop 24. Uh, George Henry, you had uh, Prop 24, you might wanna unmute there. Uh, hello? Hi, yeah. Uh, Merith, uh, one of our co-sponsors asked uh, about the next to last slide for Proposition 24, uh, if, about the endorsements. Uh, it was on one of your slides. Let me see if I can go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here and see if I can go back and uh, go back to Proposition 24. It's one of the next to last slides. Uh, it, was, uh, it was folks maybe who was against or for 24. Let me see what I can do here. I'm going to pull it up. Give me just a moment. Uh, here, let's see. Uh, this is the next to last slide on who is against Proposition 24 and who is for Proposition 24. Merith, uh, you had asked a question. I, I, I hope you, uh, are you there with us? Can you talk at all? Are you muted? Let's see. So uh, she, Merith asked about uh, whether the next to last slide for Proposition 24 were these endorsements of, of yes or no. And, and George Henry, these are folks that are uh, yet, or no's I'm rather, these are folks against 24, yeah, is that are, right? Yeah, these are no's against Prop 24. I probably should have uh, worded it differently, but these are the people who have sort of explicitly said like do not support Prop 24. Okay, they're on record as being against 24. Yes. Okay, and I'm gonna go back and these are the folks that are 424, most notably uh, the developer, Alistair McTaggart, is that right? Yes. Okay, all right, so we're gonna end with uh, two final questions, if you will. Uh, Noor, uh, why don't you throw a question out, then Gabriel, you throw a question out, and that'll be it for tonight. Sure, uh, I have a question, I think, for Prop 25, uh, Guadalupe, um, and it was just kind of a clarification, excuse me, clarification question about um, she's asking, did I hear correctly that anyone charged with the felony would be ineligible for release pending trial? So if you could just clarify. Yeah, so unfortunately I misspoke. Um, there are exclusions to the eligibility for risk release assessments, but it does not necessarily mean that they're felonies. There are 10 primary exclusions. I could go through them, um, but I'm just going to give you guys like a roundabout on like what they are. So if a defendant um, violates penal code 290, which, uh, specifically is for, um, uh, sorry, it's for, uh, domestic violence crimes. Also, if it's felony arrest for violent crimes, their third offense, their third DUI arrest in 10 years with a blood alcohol level of 0.2 or higher, um, as well as three or more warrants for failing to appear in, um, court. So there are exceptions to the eligibility of uh, risk release assessments, but it's not necessarily just felonies 
or it's not felonies at all. It's just like there's certain exclusions. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Gabriel, you wanna unmute there and ask one our last question and then we'll close out. Yeah, I've got a question for Jacob on Prop 14. And that is who gets the profits from successful research, the state, taxpayers, or pharmaceuticals? All right, uh, this is a great question because I had actually just forgotten to mention it in my presentation. So um, Prop 14 actually makes it impossible for the state to use any benefits that they receive uh, for anything other than uh, CERM funded uh, programs. So any royalties that are earned uh, must be fed back into programs to make certain funded treatments more affordable. All right. Well, thank you very much there. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to say thank you to all of you for being here. It's a, it's a long running public midterm, if you will. Uh, I wanna thank Noor and, and Gabriel especially for their help uh, and all their fine work headed up to this the students for doing all this uh, great research related to their measures, both statewide and locally, and to all of you uh, for uh, joining us tonight. There will be a link that we will provide for this uh, onto a Google Drive. I would like uh, anyone who is interested in that to email me in the Department of Political Science. Uh, and, and what I will do is if, if you will email me in the Department of Political Science, we'll make sure that we get that link out to you and so that you can follow up and, and watch this again. It will be recorded, uh, has been recorded and we'll stop the recording after this. But uh, I just wanna thank you again for joining us. Thank everyone as well. If you wanna follow up for specific questions, there were a lot more questions that were put out there. We're happy to direct those to the students as well because they've done all this research. Again, thank you very much. Uh, be safe, be healthy, and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Good night.